Welcome to the 333rd episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with John McNally, author of the collection, The Fear of Everything, Stories. And stay tuned for after the interview, when John McNally reads from one of his stories. Stay tuned for the interview. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. Listen to audiobooks during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Reading and Writing Podcast Special Offer. Get two audiobooks for the price of one with your first month of membership with code RWPODCAST. That's code RWPODCAST for two audiobooks for the price of one for your first month of membership at Libro.fm. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is John McNally, author of the new story, short story collection, The Fear of Everything Stories. 2020 also marks the 20th anniversary of John's debut book, Troublemakers, of which Richard Russo wrote, John McNally is an electrifying writer whose stories burrow under the skin. His world becomes our world, his way of seeing ours. Resistance is futile. John, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me, Jeff. Well, your new short story collection is The Fear of Everything. Did you address your personal fears in some of the stories in the collection? I, it's always, um, I always realize in retrospect what I'm, what I'm addressing in the, in the stories. It's, you know, I, I, I talk to my students a lot about this, which is that when you're writing, you're writing, ideally, when you're writing early drafts of, of your, of your work, you're tapping into your unconscious mind, but it's hard to know what, you know, what that means in terms of how it's feeding into the story. And it's usually not until a book is actually published that I go back and I, and I think, oh, yeah, I, I actually am writing about very particular things because I can begin seeing patterns in nine different stories or, or somebody else points it out in a review, for example. So, so unconscious. So to answer your question, I would say unconsciously, yes. Well, we're living in a time of fear right now, whether it's the fear of people who don't look like us or the medical fears of a global pandemic. Do you think fiction and stories is a way of looking at these fears? I I do. It's, I mean, I feel like my, to me, the, the point of literature is to, is walk in somebody else's shoes. I mean, that's really kind of the, at, at, at kind of its basic level, that's what you're doing. And that's what I'm trying to do is to put somebody else inside the consciousness of a character that may not be like them. And so I do think that, you know, I think there've been studies that show that reading, for example, uh, people who read tend to be more empathetic. Um, and that's really Kind of the the art of fiction is that you're you're trying to develop the sense of empathy with with the uh, with the character so that reader feels empathetic. So you know, so I would hope so. Well, many writers view their novels and short stories as their children. That said, do you have a favorite story from your latest collection? And if so, can you tell us about it? Sure, I I think. I'm fond of the title story, but I'm also fond of this there's a kind of quirkier story in the book called The Creeping End. And uh, it's really, it's, it, it's called The Creeping End, a triptych. And a triptych is this idea of piecing together three panels that are in some way related. And, and that story came about because it was, I was dealing with three autobiographical episodes, I guess, but I was trying to write three different stories and I couldn't get them to work individually. And then one day I realized that they were, they were actually in, in communication with each other. And so I attempted to see what it would look like putting the three stories together. So it's in addition to being meaningful on a personal level to me, it also 
it, it, artistically, I was doing something I hadn't done before, which was also trying to try, I wanted to see if I could write a story with three distinctly different tones that, that, uh, in some ways, like jigsaw puzzle pieces, uh, fits. Well, I was curious about your creative process when writing a short story, and I, I wondered if it's the same every time. When you sit down to start writing a story, do you have a vague idea in mind, or do you just start with a compelling first line and see where it takes you? I, I usually have a really vague, like vague, vague <laughs> idea of some general movement of some kind, but I don't, I don't really have much in terms of specifics. And these days, I think when I, when I end up sitting down to write a story, I've been thinking about it sometimes for as long as 10 years. So it's not, I work on a lot of different things, you know, which is good. So I can, <laughs> otherwise I would never be able to finish anything, but, um, but I, I, it, it's a long gestation period. And part of that gestation is just kind of, you know, I, I feel like if there's a, if there's an image or if there's an idea that, that continues haunting me, um, that I can't kind of shake, then I go back to it and I, and then I begin kind of teasing it out a little bit to see if there's anything there. Do you work on multiple short stories at one time? I do. I work on multiple projects, big and small. So, um, I, I tend to just work on the thing that's calling to me the most. And then when I get uh, bored with it, or if I don't feel that there's energy there, or if I'm stuck, I put it aside and work on something else. So uh, I, this collection, actually, uh, each of my collections, I've written three collections. Each one has taken 10 years. And it's not because those are the only things I'm working on, but it's just just try to be patient with the process. Um, so one of the stories in the fear of everything I began working on 10 years before the book, uh, before I finished the book, I wrote about half of the story, didn't know where to take it, set it aside and then came back to it 10 years later. And that's what I was about to ask you. Do you come back later with <laughs> new ideas or new energy? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's, and again, it's, it's, you know, I, there are a lot of things that I begin writing and I sometimes write entire drafts of put aside and then I completely forget about until I'm moving or packing or cleaning. And then I run across something from 10, 15 years ago and I think, wow, I, I, don't, I have no memory of this at all. So it's the things that stick with me that, as I said, that kind of haunt me in some way are the ones that I end up going back to. And occasionally there are strange things that happen. So, for example, there's a story called A Phone Call in this book. The, the origin of that actually goes back to about 1990 or 1989, rather. And my mother died in December of 1988. And probably about eight months or so after that, I just I was up. I was up late one night. I began working on this idea for a story. And and I rarely write a story in a complete draft uh, in, in a complete in one sitting. And I did that night and it was clearly a, it wasn't a particularly good story, but it was clearly a, a cathartic story in terms of dealing with the death of my mother and trying to you know, have some closure. Um, a couple of days later, I went back to look at that story and I couldn't find that story. I'd lost it. I kept thinking about it because I thought the idea of it was interesting and it was something that I wanted to do something with, but it wasn't until about uh, 2000 and, 10 or so that a friend of mine was editing an anthology of stories inspired by Ray Bradbury. And he asked me to contribute to it. And at first I was like, well, I don't really write those kinds of stories. I don't know. Even though Bradbury was a, you know, was a kind of idol of mine in childhood. Uh, but then I remember that story. And I thought, well, that is actually, cause there's a fantastical element in it. That's like, it's a good opportunity to go back and revisit it. So that was a gap of, you know, I don't know, 20, like 20 years. <laughs> and then I, I went back, I wrote the story. And then when I was moving to Louisiana, I found that original draft in a box I had written 20 <laughs> years earlier. So, so to me, it's, you know, I trying to impart to my students sometimes that there's this lifelong continuum and you're working on stuff and that nothing is really, really wasted. It's all there in your head and, and it comes out in some, in some form eventually. 
Well, given yeah. what you said, where you have um, stories that you have kind of abandoned, so to speak, and you come back to, or the the example that you just um, gave, do you have any kind of organizational system outside of your computer? Do you print things out and and try to like keep track of them? I print things. Out. I'm, 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 I have, I have terrible org- organizational skills. <laughs> <laughs> like absolutely abysmal organizational skills. Um, I mean, I, I lose things, drafts of things daily. So I don't, it's not, that's not good. No, it's not. Cause so, and it's, and it's maddening or sometimes I'll be working on different versions of a particular, like there's a, there's a novel that I've worked on off and on. And I, and then I kind of abandoned and then I went back to look at it and I have multiple files saved on the same day of different versions. Of it, so I don't know what the most recent version is, um, but I do print things out and I, keep a stack of what I'm working on nearby. So if I'm actively working on it, it's, it's near me. Um, but other than that, I, I, it's, it's very messy. Well, do you ever sit down to work and not have a specific idea of what you want to work on that day? And if so, do you have any kind of tips or tricks to kind of get an idea and get started? You know, it's been a long time since I've done that. I mean, in terms of, I usually have ideas. I, I almost never just sit down and with with nothing in mind. Um, but one, one assignment that I give students sometimes, and it's something that I think about, a book of mine, The Book of Ralph, I was working on as a collection of short stories. And then when I began thinking about it as as a book, I, I wanted I wanted to kind of, I wanted to open it up in some way. And so I started writing these very short chapters and the short chapter, kind of short shorts. And what I did for those was I was, I would imagine a very specific place from my childhood. And I would just try to be as accurate as I could for the first couple of paragraphs or the first page and dig in deeply. And then it would eventually kind of morph into fiction at a certain point. Once I began introducing the characters and the situations so, you know, an exercise that I give to my students that often yields something for them is first to just begin making a list of, I think about a place that's not necessarily a place of, of dramatic import, something like it's not a place where something horrible happened in your life, but it's just a place that, you, that kind of comes back to you frequently. And then to try to just make a list, just a concrete list of everything that you can remember about that particular place, um, then put it in prose, then try to add a fictional character after you've written two pages of just straight description of the place. And I think what that does is it just, it, it, it allows the, the writer to, again, get into that unconscious state where you're remembering something from the past, but you begin remembering things that you'd long forgotten. And then once you open it up to, to, you know, introduce fictional characters into the situation, then it becomes, there's more of a connection between, there's more of a personal connection to the thing that you're working on. So, so that's one assignment that I, that I give and, and that, I've, that I've used in the past. Well, in addition to short stories, you've also written novels as well as memoirs. In your memoir, The Boy Who Really, Really Wanted to Have Sex, The Memoir of a Fat Kid, I'm curious, had you always written memoir or um, in addition to fiction? No. And, and in fact, I, I'm just, I always thought that I just, I just wasn't very good at writing about myself. And what happened with that particular book, I have books that are caught, like books that I set out to write and then they're accidental books. And that was an accidental book in the sense that I wasn't thinking of it in terms of a book. I was going through a lot of stuff. My, I was, I was uh, in a divorce. My father uh, had just died. I was getting ready to move 900 miles to Louisiana. And so I was, and I was also just kind of burnt out on writing fiction at that time. This was about 10 years ago. And so I just began writing, and I got an assignment to write a very short, like 800 word autobiographical piece. And I wrote that. And once I wrote that, it kind of opened up memories of some other things that I had forgotten about. So, so then I wrote a couple more pieces. Uh, and every time I wrote a piece, it would, it would just 
and it was like gremlins or something. It was like, you know, it's like, I, it was just, I would, suddenly I, I had, I would have four or five more ideas of, of potential essays. And so I would write those. And then at a certain point when I was about three quarters through, I thought, you know, this, it's turning into a book. Um, so that was how that came about. It, it just, it, I, I didn't, I had no intention of writing a memoir. And do you have any uh, additional memoirs or collections of personal essays planned? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe at a certain point it, uh, it'll start happening again, but I, I, I felt like I'd written everything. I mean, it's a fairly short book, so I didn't have that much to say to begin with. <laughs> but um, but I felt like I'd covered the kinds of things. I you know I think part of it was it was what was interesting was was that. I, had a, I was really close to my mother and I thought a lot of the essays I would begin writing thinking like, Oh, this would be an essay that, that in some way deals with my relationship with my mother. And eventually my father would, would come into the essay and kind of take it over. And I think, I, you know, first of all, I was dealing with the death of my father at that time, but also just my father was a really kind of cryptic man. It was very hard to understand. I, I, like, like I understood my mother and I had a very close relationship with her. My father was just kind of a mystery to me. And so I think that the book ultimately was a, was me trying to kind of work through that and trying to understand my father, even though that wasn't the intent. Well, you attended the Iowa writers workshop. What was that experience like for you? Well, I was really young, so it, it's, so I wasn't very, so I, I, I grew I was like first in my family to, graduate from college to go to college. And so, um, so I never knew, I never knew what I was doing. So when I applied to graduate schools, really not having much of an idea of even what graduate school was, um, I applied to four schools, uh, two accepted me, one was Iowa. And so I got there and in retrospect, I think I, I was not prepared wasn't prepared in terms of just, I don't know. I think I had a lot of this kind of residual blue collar anger <laughs> you know, from like my, my background and, and I didn't get financial aid and I was very resentful about that. And I was one of the very few people who didn't get financial aid. Um, so it was, it was a, it was an odd time. I think I just, I, I was not, you know, if I'd gone back knowing everything I know now, it, it'd be a little. I would, I would definitely have taken better advantage of the time that I had. That said, I had some. I, I learned a lot. I had a lot of great teachers. I had a lot of um, a lot of my classmates who who um, whose whose work I was impressed with and who who've gone on to do great things. Um, so, you know, it's been like 30, 30 years now. Thirty thirty three years now. So it all seems a little bit hazy and like a dream in some ways. <laughs> I remember playing pool a lot. I really worked on my pool game during those, during those two years. I was 21. So I, I, I didn't, I didn't have the discipline of like, of, of like sitting down. A lot of people who, who were in the program at the time, many of them were in their late twenties or early thirties. Some were older, but they already had book manuscripts. Some had agents. And I was just, a just kind of a kid, not really having an idea what I was doing. And did you stay in touch with your classmates? I've stayed in touch with a handful. I mean, certainly Facebook has helped in terms of in terms sure. of that. But yeah, I, I uh, there there are a handful that I've stayed in touch with over the years. So, what are your earliest memories of writing, and when did you know that you wanted to pursue writing as a career or vocation? Well, my earliest memory was in fourth grade that the, the te our fourth grade teacher wanted us to write a play and perform it. And I was, in, I was a pathologically shy kid. So the performing part scared the hell out of me, but, uh, but I was interested in writing this play. And so I, I wrote a play about, I was, I was, a, I was a, you know, as the, as the memoir subtitle tells you, I was a fat kid. And so I wrote a play about a fat superhero who goes into a phone booth and tries to change into a superhero costume and he gets stuck because he's too fat. Um, and I performed it and my classmates were, were laughing at it. They were entertained, but I was kind of keeping my eye on the teacher to see what she thought. And she was laughing. 
And I thought, wow, well, maybe this is something I could do. Um, so that kind of piqued my interest, but it wasn't until I was in college and I, I had taken a poetry class at Southern Illinois University with Rodney Jones, who was, who was teaching an introduction, introductory creative writing class. That was really the first time that I, first of all, that I had met a real writer. Um, and secondly, was able to kind of see that, oh, writers also teach. Um, but I hadn't read anything at that time. I, I wasn't, I read Mad Magazine as a kid, so I really wasn't a big reader. Um, I liked books. I liked the idea of books, but I didn't read that many of them. So, <laughs> so, so Rodney gave me lists of books to read and, um, yeah. And so he was extremely generous with encouraging me. And, and pretty much from that point on, I just became obsessed with reading, consuming as much as I could during those, during those years when I had the time and energy to do that. And then also just writing. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are writing their own stories and novels or even memoir? I mean, the advice I always give my students is don't put yourself in debt. That's just kind of a general <laughs> advice, which is because time is the writer's most valuable commodity. Um, and when you put yourself in debt, it limits what you can do. That aside, uh, really, I, I, I think developing a habit of writing, I, you know, you, we never hear about exercise block. You know, like you, you either go to the gym or you don't. You either exercise <laughs> or you don't. Uh, but writer's block is this thing that I, I don't really, I don't really believe in it. I feel like you either sit down and you write or you don't. And I realize there are life circumstances that make it difficult. And I've certainly had those, but I think the, the, the advice is that if you develop that habit, you sit down, even if you don't get that much done or you get, you know, hardly anything done, eventually things kind of click into place and you end up living more deeply inside the thing that you've made a habit than the thing you do casually. And, and it's easier to tap into that unconscious mind where I think the really interesting things are. Um, it's like being in the zone. It's like, you know, it's like watching Michael Jordan hit three pointers all night long um, where it just seems like you can't miss. Those things eventually happen, I think, through developing a habit. I, you know, at any time I'm, anytime I take any time off, it takes me several weeks to kind of ramp back into it. I'm work, but if I'm working every day, I begin tapping into all kinds of interesting things that I, things I'd forgotten about, or um, I begin seeing connections and patterns that, that are interesting. So what novels or nonfiction books have you enjoyed recently? Oh, well, I'm on a Graham Greene kick, kick right now. He's somebody who I, who I should have read years ago and for, for whatever reason i didn't and i've been spending a lot of time in, uh, about a lot of time i've been spending time in thailand um and i took i think the last time i, I was there i took uh graham green's our man in havana with me and fell in love with this with the writing the kind of sensibility the worldview um so i've been doing that and kind of catching up on that um, otherwise, I've been, there's some books that I just want to revisit. I'm a huge Charles Portis fan. Some Masters of Atlantis is a book that I, which is probably one of my favorite books, but I haven't read it in, in several years. So I have that on my stack to read. Um, I mean, those are the two that come to mind off, offhand. Sure. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your books and stories? Probably the best place right now is uh, my Facebook author page, uh, the address of which I should know, but I, <laughs> I can't remember offhand. <laughs> but uh, I, think if, I think if they just search your name, John McNally on Facebook, I'm sure they'll end up there. Yeah, yeah. There are two. There are two. There's my personal page, and then there's my author page, and the author yeah, yeah. page. I'm wearing a blue shirt in the author page. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's good. Well, again, we've been speaking with John McNally, author of the new short story collection, The Fear of Everything Stories. The collection is available now, so go buy a copy. And John, thanks for doing this interview. Yeah, thanks so for, thanks, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great. And now stay tuned as John McNally reads from his story, The Blueprint of Your Brain. 
This is the opening of The Blueprint of Your Brain. One month ago, Jimmy Presco accidentally burned down his parents' new garage. He was 12 years old. A pile of charred debris now sat in their driveway, and you could smell what had burned and melted from several blocks away. His mother sat across from him, snipping an article from the newspaper with her toenail scissors. All the articles she saved looked like doilies because of the curved blades of the scissors. Every few minutes, Jimmy's father appeared out the living room's bay window, pushing the lawnmower and smoking. He hadn't spoken much to Jimmy since the fire episode. Jimmy didn't blame him, really. Look at this, Jimmy's mother said, handing over one of her scalloped-edged newspaper clippings. The story was about a new program for latchkey kids. If a girl or boy came home from school and started feeling lonely or frightened or sad, all she or he had to do is pick up the phone, dial zero, and say to the operator, Grandma, please, to speak to an elderly woman, or Grandpa, please, to speak to an elderly man. A moment later, the child would be connected. According to the mayor who spearheaded the program, it served two goals. It provided a sense of comfort for the rudderless kids in town, and it gave meaning to the lives of forgotten retirees who were lonely themselves and felt that their connection to society was slipping through their fingers. It's a win-win, the mayor was quoted as saying. His mother said, pin that to the fridge, okay? When Jimmy said nothing, his mother said, remember, just pick up the phone, dial zero, and say, Grandpa, please. Jimmy stared outside where his father ran over a tennis ball that Jimmy had forgotten to pick up. The ball shot out of the lawnmower's side as though from a batting cage pitching machine. When the shredded ball whacked the bay window, Jimmy's mother jumped, but Jimmy didn't so much as flinch. Okay, Jimmy said to his mother, Grandpa, please. Got it. The following Saturday, for the first time since the fire, Jimmy's parents left him alone while they went shopping at Home Depot. At first, Jimmy spent time staring at his hands until they began to freak him out. It was grotesque the way each hand had sprouted fingers, and if that wasn't enough, each finger was a different length. On closer inspection, he noticed fine blonde hair up and down each finger, hair that was barely noticeable right now, but he imagined it growing thicker as he aged until both hands looked like his mother's white cashmere gloves. The thought made him queasy and sad in equal measures. Jimmy reached into his pocket and pulled out the new smartphone his parents had brought him. He pressed zero. When the operator, an elderly woman, answered, Jimmy said, Grandpa, please. Oh, the operator said, oh yes, hold on, honey. Jimmy waited patiently through a series of clicking sounds, breathing in through his nose the awful smell of the burnt garage. An old man finally came on the line and said, Yeah, who is it? Jimmy Presco, Jimmy said. Jimmy Presco, Jimmy Presco. There was silence. Then, do I know you? Are you trying to sell me something? Because if you are, you can go to hell, Jimmy Presco. No, sir. Jimmy wanted to explain about the news article, but the entire story, his reason, for, his reason for calling, suddenly seemed pathetic now. So all he replied was, Grandpa, please. Grandpa, the old man said. What the? Oh, wait, you're one of those what you call it? Latchkey kids. The old man laughed. That's right. Latchkey. Jesus, they've got a name for everything nowadays, don't they? Latchkey, for God's sake. Are you sad? He asked. Is that it? Are you lonely? He laughed. Well, boo-hoo. Jimmy said I burned down my parents' garage. Well, now I'm impressed, the old man said. A firebug, eh? He cleared his throat. Listen, I need a favor. You think you can do something for me? As the old man explained what he wanted, Jimmy's mood lifted. He felt as though he were being pulled out of a giant vat of molasses and hosed down. It was, he hoped, a new beginning.